Sheila Schollers, Senior Software Engineer at IBM, responsible for client advocacy. With me today is Kurt Kotner, IBM Fellow, Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for Database Servers and IBM Database Tools. In this brief video, you'll learn about advancements in our new DB2 version 10 database and how our IBM database tooling takes advantage of those new features. These enhancements are specifically designed to significantly increase performance and efficiency while lowering storage and administration costs. Kurt, thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. All right. So uh, there's a lot of excitement around uh, the recent uh, new release of DB2 version 10, or Galileo as we've come to know it. Uh, can you share with us some of the key highlights in DB2 for LUW uh, version 10? Sure. What we've tried to do with the, the new release of DB2 LUW is, is take a major new step with the platform. And what we're trying to do is, is simplify the deployment of DB2 and get to where a, a single version of DB2 can do a lot of things that our separate versions used to do in the past. So you look at things like pure scale. With pure scale now, we can scale out from just a single SMP that's running the, the operational DB2 system to it could be up to 128 different machines that are all clustered together and have a single view of the data. And this gives us scalability advantages that none of our competitors can match. You look at some of the things we've done with parallelism. In the past, if you wanted to do high volume query work like a warehouse would do, you had to buy the DPF version of DB2 that would partition the data across multiple machines and then we would cut up the query and farm it out to the different machines to speed up the speed of the query. With the new parallelism capabilities that are in the DB2 product now, you can get those same kind of performance characteristics on a single SMP, and instead of us spinning the work off to different machines, we just spin it off to the different cores that are on the one machine, and we can get the same kind of speeds and feeds. So this, over time, is painting a picture where you'll eventually get to a point that there will be a single binary of DB2 that can do warehouse, OLTP, all these different workloads, and you don't actually have these physically different deployments or physically different implementations of the DB2 product. So it'll be an exciting thing now where mixed workloads, where you have warehouse and online transaction processing in the same box, are actually a, a real viable solution. With all of this, obviously, it translates into huge benefits for our DB2 customers. Now, with all of that power in the database, it helps to have a strong set of supporting tools. Uh, give us an idea of how our IBM database tools uh, exploit Galileo functionality throughout the data life cycle. And if you don't mind, let's start with uh, the multi-temperature storage and adaptive compression uh, technology. Yeah, so what we tried to do with the tools is we tried to focus on the things that were really going to be the compelling value propositions of the Galileo release. So multi-temperature data was one of the big value propositions. You know, we've all seen that the speeds and feeds of the solid state technology has become very important. And so what we're now able to do is we can assign a certain range of data to, a, say, a solid state disk that's getting access very, very frequently. This might be data for the last week or the last month. And then we might have a slower speed traditional SATA drives and things like that that we assign to the cold pool. And then maybe some higher speed disk drives that are for the warm pool. And now what the tools can do is they can, as the data ages, you can move it from one storage pool to the next and you can transition this data that was on the solid state disk to the slower speed disk over time. And eventually we can even put things in there like optical storage that's even got slower speed characteristics. And then things like adaptive compression, one of the big value propositions of DB2 has always been that you can shrink this, the disk footprint of the data that you're storing. With adaptive compression, we've now moved from having a single compression dictionary for the entire table to a point where we have compression dictionaries within each page, and our tools have the ability to find opportunities where there's tables that have the need for additional compression and you'd get a big benefit, or if there's a table that, for example, needs to be reorged to release the free space, the tools will find those opportunities and identify where you ought to bring those techniques to bear. Right, so, okay, uh, let's talk for a moment about temporal data and time travel query, which I understand allows customers, for example, to travel into the past to see what their data said at different points in time, all without changing the application logic. 
It sounds a little like science fiction to me. Can you explain how this works and perhaps share the rationale for delivering this functionality inside the database engine? Sure. So when we talk to customers about what they do in their real applications, it turns out that almost every industry we talk to, whether it's retail, insurance, uh, financial, they all have this notion of temporal data. With retail, it's prices of things that you sell in your retail store. They change based on is it the Labor Day weekend, is it Christmas holiday, is it Thanksgiving? And so the price is a function of time, and you need the ability in your application to, to identify when did you sell something to determine what it cost. Same thing's true for insurance, same thing's true for banking. You know, if you think about banking, you have certificates of deposit, and if you're in that period of time, you have a higher interest rate. If your CD expires, you get a lower interest rate. It turns out that most customers we talk to, they spend one-third of the application just coding these rules in there to apply the right interest rates and the right, uh, for the right period of time. If you could encode that inside the database so that the database can do all that for you, now when you apply a query and you say, I want to see the data as of this point in time, the database gets the right thing right out of the box. And the, the thing that became difficult for customers is that many of their applications, they didn't just have one or two tables that had temporal characteristics. They had 10, 20, and they were joining them together. It became to where an end user couldn't formulate the query well. So what we've done here is we've put that knowledge inside the database. We've enhanced our tools, like our Data Studio tools, so that it can issue these kinds of queries. And now, just by specifying, I want the data as of this point in time, you'll get a consistent answer set, and you don't have to devote 30% of your application code to producing that answer. It's all built into the query that you pass to DB2. So it becomes very important to, to getting a, a much more flexible and agile development experience because the database is doing a lot of the work for you. I see. So the benefits are baked into the database by design. Mm -hmm. Now, how is it that our IBM database tools leverage temporal tables to yield even further benefits? So we've done a, a bunch of things in the, in the tooling to make it possible for you to declare the tables, uh, provide the temporal attributes to it. Uh, it's got the ability that if you take, for example, our IDA product that does modeling, if you compare two systems and one system has a set of tables that have the temporal characteristics and another doesn't, it can identify exactly what those DDL differences are. You can say, I want to take these temporal attributes that are in my test system and apply them now to production. It can take all those DDL changes and automatically apply them to the other system. So it really simplifies your migration of installing these kind of changes as moving it through your life cycle. It, it automates that whole process so that you make far fewer mistakes when you're trying to deploy changes. Right. There's clearly a concerted effort to ensure that our database tools exploit the many new features in DB2. Describe what that looks like with respect to the pure scale, scalability, and resilience capabilities in DB2 version 10. So there's a bunch of things we've done in here. Uh, we'll start with OPM. Our performance monitor is key for managing performance on, on any kind of system. It becomes especially important if you're looking at something like PureScale, where you have a large number of machines that are clustered together. So what we've done with OPM is we've extracted out all the performance metrics that DB2 knows about, and we've provided a very sophisticated UI that lets you look at things like buffer pool hit ratios, CPU utilization, I.O. characteristics. And it'll show you that as a function of not only what's the average across these machines that are in the cluster, but where are the hot spots in the cluster? Is there one particular cluster where the buffer pool hit ratio isn't particularly good? Or where the I.O. seems to be constrained, where memory is running short? And so you have a bunch of automated alerts in here now where you can have the OPM product monitor these things, identify where the hot spots are, and then it gives you an, an opportunity to go out and tune and, and make corrections. And we've done a bunch of other things in, in this whole area with PureScale in terms of helping you set up high availability for PureScale. So one of the new changes that's come with the Galileo release is you can have a geographically dispersed sysplex where you have some members in one geography and some in another. And our tooling can help you set up those configurations and make sure that you have an optimal solution in terms of mean time to, f to recovery after a failure. I see. So finally, let's talk about um, what's trending in the database arena. Everybody wants to hear about this, such as the NoSQL efforts, uh, which to some on the surface uh, would seem to be antithetical to the nature of relational databases. Well, I think what we're doing with NoSQL is not that different than what we've done in the past. If you, if you look back 10 years ago when we did object relational, 
there was a big uptick in interest in object databases, and, and we responded by producing things like user-defined types, user-defined functions, store procedures, triggers. All these features gave you object-style behavior inside the database. Now there's a lot of interest in the NoSQL movement, and, and there's many different uh, trends within that. There's, there's a set of NoSQL solutions that are focused on XML. There's some that are based on key value uh, stores. There are others that are based on graph technology. So what we've done in the Galileo release is we've shipped a graph NoSQL solution that's based on RDF. It sits on top of DB2 as the underlying data store. But this is, gives us the ability to do these graph stores using a NoSQL API, but a relational database as the underlying storage mechanism. And we're finding that that solution outperforms the open source NoSQL solutions four to one. And so it gives us some significant performance advantages, and it gives, uh, more importantly, our customers more flexibility on deployment techniques in their applications. One of the reasons that people are starting to look at NoSQL is they feel that some of these technologies are, are a bit more agile than traditional relational modeling and de negotiating with your DBA and working with your data modeler. And so we're trying to demonstrate that with the DB2 product, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can choose to continue to do things the traditional way with data modeling and DBAs and all of that. Or if you want to be much more agile and you just throw things into a NoSQL store, you can do that as well. But both kinds of data can be stored in DB2, and you can do the same solutions for scaling out with pure scale, doing backup recovery with the same techniques, doing performance monitoring and auditing with the same t techniques. And so it, it gives us a, a, a new spin that we can bring to the application developer to say the relational products are still very relevant to what you want to do. That's great. Can you comment on the buzz around a new product, Capture Replay? Yeah, we're spending a bunch of time on the Capture Replay technology because one of the things we find when we talk to customers is that only 10% or less of their production workloads are automated so that they can actually do an effective test before they make system changes and, and bring them into production. And those system changes could be anything. It could be application changes. It could be changes to buffer pools, adding new indexes, rebinding plans and packages, a whole bunch of things. When you can only test 10% of that workload, you got 90% exposure that something's going to go wrong because you didn't have a chance to test it properly. So what we're doing with Capture Replay technology is we're able to capture your entire production workload query by query with the same inputs and the same outputs. We record everything that happened, kind of like a flight simulator for an airline pilot. Then we can take that over your system, replay the exact same scenarios, and now you can, with our replay tool, we can monitor the behavior on the replayed environment and compare it to the original and say, how close were we? Did we get similar performance characteristics? Did we get the same SQL codes? Did we get the same number of rows? And so we've got a, a whole set of very comprehensive reports that we can produce that'll tell you exactly how close you were to your original result. And if you had made tuning changes, it'll tell you, did it work or not? Did it, did it run faster or did it run slower? And if it ran slower, which queries ran slower and why? And so this is really a, a new thing for us where we've deeply integrated the testing technology with the performance reporting and the tuning, and so we can really close the loop. And, and if you pick a simple example, like I, I added three indexes, you would expect to see that some of your inserts and updates are going to degrade because you have to maintain these new indexes. You would also expect that a bunch of select statements should get better, and this thing will spot. Did, did that, in fact, happen? Did you get select statements that improved because they have new indexes to work with? So it's, it's a very comprehensive and well-integrated solution in the tools to really take what you have in the database and make the most out of it. Lots of game-changing technology in DB2 version 10 and the database tooling. Kurt, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. All right. So if you'd like to learn more about IBM's new DB2 version 10 database and our database tooling, visit us at ibm.com slash software slash data. This is Sheila Schollers with Kurt Kotner, IBM Fellow, Vice President and CTO for Database Servers and Database Tooling. Thanks for listening.